and uh, Crystal Jackson, but hopefully they'll they'll hop on. So welcome back to the members of the committee. So if Mark haven't seen you in a while. No, uh, I don't know if I missed a meeting or if I, I, uh, there hasn't been one or. No, we, we took a hiatus while the housing production plan was being developed. Right. So um, the thought tonight was to, to try to kind of pick up now that we have something to work with, um, pick up where we left off last year um, and try to figure out a path forward. Um, okay, and you'll notice that, uh, so Tony Marullis from the university um, is joining with us. He's not a voting member of the committee, but uh, part of our negotiations with the university every year is we look for ways that we can work cooperatively, promote better communication and collaborate. Um, so Tony has volunteered to sit in on this meeting um, so that he's kind of aware of the things that we might be talking about. Um, and he can offer some insight uh, from the university's perspective where it's warranted. Okay, and it looks like Crystal just joined us as well. Um, so while we were away, uh, Dylan Mance uh, decided to step down from all of his committee assignments. Um, Dylan and his wife are expecting. Um, and he believes that his attention may be warranted elsewhere coming soon. So, um, you know, I thank Dylan, obviously, for all of the, the input he had on this committee, and he's hoping at some point he'll be able to rejoin. Um, but at least for the time being, he stepped down. Um, Crystal Jackson had been appointed as a, an alternate, so I talked to Crystal, um, and she's here with us tonight. So um, I would imagine that if she so desires, um, we could make her appointment formal. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. So far, so good, Crystal. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Glad I'm able to attend and glad we're able to get things moving. Okay, good. Um, so uh, first order of business is, is the housing production plan. So I sent a copy of that to everybody. I don't know if you've had a chance to read through that. Um, but I did want to point out, and I, I just forwarded an email, the housing production plan committee or work group um, has been asked to do a presentation on that plan uh, that is going to take place on March 8th at seven o'clock at the senior center. Um, as you can imagine, there are many interested parties to the, the outcome of that housing production plan. You know, so certainly it was, um, you know, under the purview of the planning board um, that uh, and the select board signed off on it as well that we would move forward to create that plan. Um, but now that it's been published, uh, they're, uh, you know, it's um, trying to remember the name of the work group, but there's like a, a dementia um, and aging friendly group um, where a lot of topics around housing came up in their work. Um, you know, so I think it makes sense to have that, that public presentation. And I'm hoping that members of our committee can go as well. So I'm just going to toss out. I don't know if anybody has any immediate thoughts about that housing production plan um, and where we might want to take it. Um, so I guess, Bill, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how the planning board is handling that? Or well, We haven't taken it up formally yet. We're uh, going to discuss that at our meeting next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Select board has approved it already. I see that the Conservation Commission is discussing the applicability of the uh, uh, conversion of the hotel to affordable housing at their meeting tonight, even as we talk. Um, I took a quick look through the plan, and one of the targets that would be an easy meet is that if we could get 50 units of affordable housing added to the inventory by the Econo Lodge conversion from a hotel to uh, perpetually affordable apartments, uh, that would be a, a giant step towards 
meeting some needs here. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to be looking at that. That um, that uh, series of public hearings is going to open on February 28th, Monday night. The uh, ZBA will uh, open the public hearing. And I don't recall exactly when it is going to be, whether it's uh, 6, 6.30 or 7, but uh, they are, their agenda is posted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Laura Baker had reached out um, and she, if you recall, Laura was in front of our committee uh, multiple times uh, about the Econo Lodge and she did reach out and she's hoping that, you know, she'll get some support um, at the ZBA meeting so that, um, you know, they can hear directly from other committees if they choose to um, about why we might be supporting that project. So, you know, again, um, as Bill said, that's February 28th. So, uh, and it, that's a Zoom meeting, Bill, or in person? Uh, it is going to be a hybrid meeting. Okay. Let me just double check that. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's the Monday the 27th. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be a hybrid meeting. Okay. All right. Well, that'll make it easier for folks to attend um, to the extent you're willing and able. So with those 50 units, we'd be up, that would be, we'd be up to like 14%. Is that right? Something of that nature. Uh, so we're in a little odd data point right now because the uh, the current state inventory is based on the 2010 census figures. And even though we are now approaching 2023 or in 2023, the um, the data set that the state needs to update the affordable housing inventory has not yet been released by the census. So that we don't have the 2020 numbers. And specifically, we don't know how many we know we have added no affordable units since the 2010 census, but we don't know how many dwellings we have added as that is defined. So the number is going to drop. It is already a little lower in the uh, housing production plan than it is on the current state inventory. Um, but it uh, it will drop a little bit. But yes, the uh, Econo Lodge would move us to a much more comfortable position. Crystal, we're getting a lot of um, static in your phone. Uh, it might be my phone in the area that I'm in. Okay. I'm trying my yeah, it's 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 I'm trying to switch because I just got off work at six and mm -hmm. I'm trying to make the switch over from my work computer to my um home computer, but I'm using my phone right now. Gotcha. Yeah, you may just want to um if you want to mute it and then unmute it when you want to talk. Oh, okay, I, I do apologize. No, no, that's fine. Okay, well, that kind of, um, I guess we're kind of blending together the first agenda item and the second, which is the the affordable housing. So, Bill, what you're saying is this this um, Econo Lodge is really kind of the next big movement there. Yes. And don't we also have inventory? Is Mountain View rolling off in March? Uh, well, there's, that that is likewise an interesting area that we do not have uh, complete clarity on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they are scheduled, their obligation is through March, but there is a case from the uh, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court <clears throat> out of Wellesley that says that the only reason you exist in the zone you are in is because you are a uh, are came in by a comprehensive permit, you may be obligated to remain in that category if the uh, current zoning does not allow you to operate as an independent multi-unit dwelling. So, um, 
the zoning for the business district is one dwelling per lot. So Mountain View may not be able to drop off. Uh, town Council is working on it. Uh, other th than that, I, uh, I'm not privy to where they are in the discussions. Mark? Yeah, I, was, I, I just looked at the housing plan and one thing I didn't see, I saw the the number that's in the state inventory, but all of the Mountain View get counted in that, right? Because there's a certain, what is it, 25% or 15% of those houses, of those units are affordable, right? Right. I, I, I believe that all of the Mountain View units are affordable, but in a rental property, as long as 25% are affordable, the entire complex gets counted. I'm wondering if it might be um, beneficial just to have a number and in, in maybe put it in the housing plan. I don't know if it's we can still, if there's still edits going into that, of the actual number of affordable, as opposed to the ones that get counted because um, they have, they're, they're part of a uh, sub, uh, uh, you know, group of them where only, what did you say, only 20% had to be in the past? We 25. want up that number too, right? Up that to 25 25 is the number. Right. So the other 75 aren't might not be affordable, but they're being counted. Correct. So it might be nice to know how many of those there are. And then we would at least know that at some point those would be rolling off, right? Potentially. Potentially could be rolling Potentially. off. It depends on how that ruling goes that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And Bill, other than Econo Lodge, um, you know, obviously we spent the better part of, of last year really as a town focused on the Econo Lodge conversion. Um, are, are there, is there anything else that's come before the planning board of an affordable nature at this point? Uh, we have spent an inordinate amount of time trying to create a formula for payment in lieu of affordability. Right. Since we adopted our inclusionary zoning bylaw eight years ago or so, we have only had one housing subdivision that has triggered it. Mm -hmm. And that one has incurred an obligation to provide one affordable unit. Um, and uh, it, on that scale, managing a, a single affordable unit is just a pain in the, uh, a collective pain. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work up a way to do a payment in lieu to get a payment into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund where we would be able to have more flexibility in what we could do to pr preserve affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that will be something we'll take up again next Tuesday as well. Okay, so we should be paying close attention attention to your meetings then. Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you have a need for a sleep aid. Um, <laughs> really, we're. Uh, it, it turns out it's it's a it's a good concept of uh, as a developer comes in, you want them to not swing the balance by creating more. Uh, units and thereby reducing our affordable uh, but the um, logistics of getting and keeping a unit on the affordable housing inventory we have learned is uh, it's a lot of gymnastics that go into how to do that and when you have something like Winfield or whatever they're calling themselves now or uh, Mountain View where you have multiple units in the pool and you can have someone who is in charge of monitoring that. When you get into um, sale units, it becomes a lot more complex as to how you monitor it and who is responsible. You know, the developer would be responsible for doing the lottery and everything in the first round, but who pays for that in the second round? Uh, you know, five years later, seven years later. Um, these are some things that we're finding are, are especially at the scale we're working on, uh, problematic. So mm -hmm. um, 
uh, personally, I would like to encourage more contribution to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund because that can be used in a number of ways. Right, because we can leverage. purchase land, we can do a habitat, I mean, Habitat for Humanity, there are a variety of things, right? Uh, there, even things such as, uh, well, the, um, the, the Winfield has a uh, plumbing problem. Mm -hmm. The way the water main comes in was kind of done haphazardly at the time. And they could probably benefit from an improvement in how they're, um, how they're getting their town water. Um, and we have money in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that could be applied to that. Oh, okay. In exchange for which we would be looking for a, an extension of their commitment to remain affordable. Right. So <clears throat> that's the uh, the kind of uh, the kind of things we can do with money that is a lot harder to do with properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I think it seems like the more that we learn about the affordable housing trusts and how they operate across the state, um, it, you know, it seems like that. <clears throat> scope of, of what's available to us is, is widening, which is good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I appreciate everything Habitat for Humanity is doing, but that the, um, that's, but one that's, or two units. that's one or two at a time. And um, it, every bit helps and our numbers aren't so huge that um uh, uh, that, that one unit wouldn't make a difference, but it's not going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I guess going back to the housing production plan, my thought was, you know, again, it's fairly fresh off the press, so to speak. Um, there is that public, <clears throat> public meeting in a couple of weeks where uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission will be there along with our subcommittee to our, our um, committee to go through, uh, respond to questions people may have in terms of the data points, you know, what does this mean, put it in context. So what I was hoping is that, uh, and I'm sure that that meeting is going to be recorded. So if you can't make it, at least if everybody could uh, review that, um, either be there or watch it after the fact. And then it, when we meet again, maybe, a, you know, our committee could could compare notes on our takeaways of where we might want to spend some time and effort trying to move the ball forward, so to speak. I don't know if anybody had any other thoughts on that, but that's what I thought was kind of a logical next step. Yes, when is the next meeting? Uh, we'll talk about that um, at the end, Crystal. I've got the, the meeting schedule as an agenda item tonight. Oh, I thought Bill said there was a meeting coming up maybe next week or so. Uh, there's on March 8th, um, I just sent the information around. There's a public meeting. Oh, why did the I housing, think? <laughs> yeah, that's the housing production plan, and that's going to be discussed. Okay. Um, that meeting will take place at the senior center, and I'm, I'm fairly certain it will be recorded. And what time is that going to be? Uh, yeah, seven o'clock on March 8th. It's a Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Mm hmm. And then I had mentioned that there is a meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals coming up on February 27th to discuss the, uh, that's the first public hearing on the Econo Lodge conversion to affordable housing. Okay, that's what I was asking about too. Thank you so much, Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else on the first <clears throat> two agenda items then, the um, affordable housing and the housing production plan? I have a couple of my, I, do we have somebody we can send just like little comments on the uh, the housing production plan? I mean, there were just a couple of, I guess, minor um, things. Some of the data looked like they might be off a little bit on the first table that I saw. Sure. Uh, the, the chair of the committee is Jim Maximoski. Okay. Um, so either I can, if you don't have his contact information, I can send you his email address, Mark, or you can send it to me and I'll forward it right along. I think I have his address, yeah. 
Okay. And the other uh, person you would include on that would be Ken Comia uh, at uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I mean, there were just a couple of minor things. The data on um, educational attainment look, looks like it's a little, it, it just, I'd be surprised if, if it wasn't some kind of mistake in there. And then um, just little things. Um, so there's a point in here where they talk about the housing committee, and I think they're talking about this committee right here, but they don't call it the housing and economic development. I mean, not that it matters. Again, just well, yeah, I think it does because it was a little bit confusing. I there, because there's the actual Hadley Housing Authority. Oh then, yeah, that's right. They could be yeah. confused with that, but but I think when they mentioned they mentioned the housing committee, I, I weren't they referring to this committee? They they were because I I had pointed that out and yeah. kept added it in. Mm -hmm. I get you. Yep. No, that'd be great, Mark. Thank you. And then I, I guess um, just to get back to what uh, Bill was saying, the um, in in terms of going forward, it sounds like um, the the number eleven was thrown out there that to represent a plan. If we were ever to get in trouble, right? We need a plan for a, a yearly increase um, in affordable houses, and the number eleven was in there that I thought I saw eleven per eleven units per year. And I just um, thinking about, you know, one at a time, two at a time. It sounds like maybe um, multi multi units um, might be easier to manage in, in, you know, maybe one or two places with more than one, you know, multiple unit in it might be easier. Mm -hmm. I don't know if how we could how we could work that with the funds we have to make that incentivized. Yep, definitely a, a takeaway from that that document. Yeah, I'm just taking a look uh, myself because I, I, um, yeah, they, I, I see an increase in number of inventory eligible housing units by at least ten within the next twelve months to ensure maintenance of ten percent on the subsidized housing inventory. That might be actually a little. Uh, a little aggressive, but uh, page twenty six plan goals and objective number one. Yeah, it does say eleven in there on twenty six. Okay, I was on twenty eight. I got gotcha. just a point of clarification. Um, just as I'm new to this, you're not thinking about eleven units per year, though, right? It's just within the next year to yeah, a certain threshold. Actually, on 28, it says 11 affordable housing units per year. That, those are, that's the very wording. Under four two, section 4.2, the first paragraph, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the wording on that's a little bit, <clears throat> now that you point that out, it is a bit ambiguous um you know i think what uh, what they were trying to do with the data points is factor in the inventory that had the potential to roll off in future years and then how do we keep up with that because <laughs> the property formerly known as winfield <laughs> um there, there are a fair number of units there i want to say that's like 2030 bill where that might come off or let me just pull up the inventory. No. It, it, it sounds to me like it's part of the a plan to um, to have a plan to go in the other direction. Should you fall below the 10%, you want to go in the other direction by half a percent per year. So half a percent of the community's housing stock. And that's where you get the 11. Oh, that's how he's backing into it. Yeah. So if if you fall below the you know the I, I, I maybe that's not how they came up with that half a percent I'm just I'm just wondering if maybe that's what they were doing if you fall below you want to you want to go back in the other direction by half a percent a year that would be 11 units So let me just uh pull this up this is the state inventory Mm -hmm. 
So um, using 2020 figures, we're at 12.59% uh, without Econolodge. Right. And that is um, 277. 277 units. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before, yep. And see, uh, Mark, in 2032. Yep. The, that's where the uh, Winfield property. That's when that comes off. Yeah, and that's that's 80. <clears throat> right. And so in the in the production plan on 28, it says the state sets housing unit production goals and targets numbers to work towards. The annual target numbers reflect a half a percent of a community's housing stock as determined by the latest decennial census. So again, that's if you it sounds like you need to have this plan if you fall below. And then we want you to have a goal of half a percent a year going, getting yep. better by half a percent per year. To kind of the get out of jail card, right? Right, because if you have a plan on how to take it in the other direction, then you still don't have to fall under 40B, right? That is correct. If you have an approved housing production plan and are implementing it, you are treated as if you were already in compliance. Right. So that's where they come up with the half a percent. Yes. That makes sense. So some of this is very formulaic language, but I would encourage you to connect with Ken Comia, who drafted this, and he's drafted several for other communities as well. So he can uh, kind of uh, uh, tweak out what is unique to Hadley and what is something that Boston is looking for in the plan. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on that, Mark or, or Crystal? Did you have something? No, I'm just my first time. I'm just soaking everything in and trying to get an idea of what's happening. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item we had on the agenda, <clears throat> I'm calling it Route 9 Visioning. So this is something that we've touched on in previous meetings, but um, so part of, part of my thought about putting this on the agenda um, is coming off of uh, my attendance along with some other, other uh, officials and employees in town for the Mass Municipal conference that took place back in January. Um, and it was interesting because I had one of the breakout sessions had to do with housing. And they were, it, I mean, as you know, I mean, obviously, there's a, a statewide, if not a nationwide effort to address the housing crisis across all categories, if I can put it that way, right. Um, and there were some folks there from Salem, um, and I'm trying to remember the, another municipality, but they they made a presentation talking about really how you engage the the town, um, what steps should be taken uh, in terms of communication. Uh, you know, if there are any thoughts about particular projects or reimagining of areas of town that would you know. Um, have a, an affordable housing component, obviously, if there's any new housing being built, how critical it is to make sure that all of the stakeholders are involved early. Um, try to do the best you can to take all of the uh, mystery out of it so that there's less speculation, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the main takeaway from that was um, there were presentations where people exhaustively took like a multi-year approach. Um, so with Salem being an example in particular, so our, our new and current Lieutenant Governor, uh, Kim Driscoll, that's, um, she was mayor of Salem. Um, they had a, a multi-year strategy to address affordable housing, but also, you know, 
uh, revitalization of the downtown area. They wanted workforce housing, you know, and they they earmarked certain projects and they had the planning board, you know, so the uh, council was working with the planning board and, and the either regional planning, et cetera, et cetera. Again, trying to do all the right things. They laid out a multi-year strategy. Uh, they had hearings or, or uh, not hearings, well, public forums all along the way. Um, they were getting a lot of positive feedback. They conducted surveys, just like we did with the housing production plan, uh, multiple surveys. And their point being that they honestly thought they had been so thoughtful and so inclusive uh, that and, and uh, flexible. You know, they 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 weren't rigid in the original planning, right? They kept changing it along the way to accommodate excellent points that were being made for uh, people with disabilities and, and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion issues around transportation, all of that. Um, walking into the, the vote, the town vote, thinking that it was, they thought it was a lock. They just thought it was overwhelmingly going to pass um, and realized that a whole other coalition had been forming in the background that they didn't take very seriously. They thought, oh, you know, it's just a handful of voices who are not in my backyard. They're being negative. Um, but they didn't think that they carried an awful lot of weight. And when they got to the, the town meeting, they realized that that small coalition actually had been extremely organized, um, relatively quiet during the process. But they brought hundreds of their closest friends um, to the meeting. And unfortunately, the vote failed. So not to be Debbie Downer, but the, the point of the breakout session was how critically important it is to move slowly and cautiously when you're trying to affect change. And, and I just thought it was, um, you know, something certainly that our committee needs to think about if, if we do want to think about kind of reimagining as we've talked about uh, the Route 9 corridor in particular. Um, so one of the, uh, you know, another thing that has occurred kind of over the course of um, the past year is, I don't want to say we're post-COVID, but you know, we'll call it post-COVID. Um, people are coming up for air and people know that housing is a critical issue in the Commonwealth, um, in our area in particular. And there are developers now who are starting to come to the table and wondering you know, is there possi any possibility of doing anything in Hadley? So one of our planning board members, um, a former colleague of his reached out who happens to be a Hadley resident who works for an architectural and design firm uh, on the Eastern part of the state, but he lives here, was wondering, you know, is there any plan for visioning exercises or, you know, how, how are people going to think about redevelopment along the Route 9 corridor? You know, so I brought them up to speed or we brought him up to speed as best we could on what was happening with the planning board, et cetera, right now. Um, he's actually interested in the future of maybe, uh, you know, these are open meetings. He may, he may listen in on the session or whatever, but we got talking about whether or not um, we might want to put some feelers out to see if we could leverage resources. And we don't have any money, right? Um, but leverage resources through the university. Um, he mentioned that he was aware of a project that the city of Holyoke did utilizing um, the University of Massachusetts. And I don't know, there were graduate, you know, students in the planning department or, or whatever. But, you know, again, people who are studying these types of things, architecture and um, urban and rural planning. And they actually helped with that sort of thing. So they were able to do a lot of the legwork that we would otherwise, you know, have to pay consulting firms thousands of dollars to do. So I just wanted to bring it up here and get people's thoughts on if that's something that we want to be thinking about. Um, you know, I think about the planning board as well, that, you know, the it's one thing when a developer comes in and says, here's a drawing, this is what I want to do. But, you know, what What if as a town leveraging the housing production plan and knowing what our 
our current zoning is and, and what the possibilities are along Route 9 with some zoning changes that, that we started talking about what that could look like and bringing more people into that conversation. I think that's a great idea, Molly, especially with the example you showed or provided for Salem. Um, the quiet ones, they did form a giant coalition which caused Salem to fail. And having a backup plan or additional um, assistance, it, it seems like it would provide us with a leverage if something else was to come up behind us, we'd have that, that opportunity to overcome that. No one heard me? Yep. 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 Oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just really, yeah, you don't have your video on, but we, we were nodding. <laughs> oh, you don't, yeah, I'm, I'm like, you don't want to see me right now. Like, <laughs> I, I work from home, so yeah. I do not get dressed in anything. So this is not a, a face moment, but you will see me at a better time. <laughs> you will see a better crystal. <laughs> but first impressions are lasting, and I did not want this to be the first impression. <laughs> not at all. Uh, I would think the UMass um, uh, graduate students could be really helpful. I mean, in particular cases, again, we, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we had talked about maybe some um, some properties in the mall that might be going with, with nothing going on in them that might be converted. That might be a place where graduate students, it, it might be an, a good fit with a graduate student project um, to try to to make that, um, you know, a, a residential when um, also, again, if, if we were talking about um, multi-unit, uh, smaller sort of development, you know, I don't know development the right word, but, you know, small multi-unit little streets, maybe, again, I think um, along that Route 9 corridor, I think the graduate students would be, a, it would be a good, uh, good move to have their, their consulting anyway on it. Um, yeah. Obviously the, the developer, um, you know, you'd have to convince the developer and, and have them on board with the graduate students. I mean, we the town wouldn't be running that show most likely, right? We'd still be we'd still be having a developer actually control the project. We'd we'd be granting them the permits and stuff, but yeah, I, I think I, I think it's more along the lines of the of the, the role that the town the town, you know, is playing, um, is saying we're going to tell you what we want. Right. As, as opposed to developers coming in and saying, hey, we've got an idea. This is what we'd like to do. Does it meet your zoning requirements or can we get it? You know, um, that it would be more of a broader perspective where we would be in control of the the concept. Um, but yeah, then, then it gets, then you invite people to come in and propose what they're capable yeah. of willing to do. So the... Um... The problem is that zoning is more like a broadsword than a scalpel. And mm -hmm. part of what you can do with zoning is to indicate sections where you would rather see certain types of development. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, one example would be to say in the business district, we would welcome multifamily dwelling multi-unit dwellings because they um, will have the all the bike infrastructure and the sidewalks and the public transit and you can walk to restaurants and grocery stores. Um, so that's one thing you can do. You change a use category to say, you know, uh, on one level, it seems ridiculously easy. You just go from an N to a Y in mm -hmm. the block that says multifamily dwellings. Uh, and where they are allowed. It, as it is right now you, in this, the business district, it, that's a special uh, zoning board of uh, appeals? Uh, the business district is basically Route 9. No, but I mean to go to a, a multi-unit dwelling to have a... Prohibited. Oh, it's prohibited altogether. I thought it was... A, that it, And that's not... But you can do a, the zone, zoning board of appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is uh, has jurisdiction over comprehensive permits, which is what Econolodge is coming in on. 
I see. It's a special <laughs> statutory category, Chapter 40B of the general laws. Um, <clears throat> but as a general rule, no. Uh, the only multifamily we allow uh, are senior housing at the moment. Um, and then it's kind of sort of accessory apartments, not that it's really yeah. multifamily, but yeah. Yeah, but that, that's, that, that would be a change under business. Yes, you would it would it would be a change under business to allow more than one uh dwelling per lot. Well, I think we definitely should should think about you know that and how we would promote that forward. And then I'll tell you the flip side of it. <laughs> That case I discussed that holds uh, that holds affordable units on the inventory if the underlying zoning does not support a change, if if we were to hypothetically allow multifamily dwellings in the uh, business district, uh, that would allow Winfield and Mountain View to exit the affordability restriction. I gotcha. So that's that's the balancing act that uh, because they got a ZBA way they got a ZBA uh, waiver under forty so, B. So what? Why not get? Why not uh, promote more uh, ZBA waivers? That's another option. I uh, guess. We, I guess that's we, what I was thinking. We could encourage friendly, comprehensive permits. And um, one town, uh, uh, I think it's maybe Lennox, Lee or Lennox, um, they were using their affordable housing trust fund to help steer projects mm -hmm. that, uh, no, we're not going to extend the sewer line to that part of town so that you can put a uh, comprehensive, you can put an affordable unit on something that you'd like to have, but we would encourage affordable units in this part of town and we'll pay to extend the sewer line to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the kind of thing you can do. I, I will also say just to Tony, I've been on the planning board for 40 years now. And um, I will also say I'm third in seniority on the board. Uh, two people have been on for longer. Um, there's been a breathtaking lack of interest in the uh, regional planning and landscape architecture regional planning department in engaging with Hadley. Um, we never hear from you. Well, uh, so Bill, to that point, um, just just to be fair, um, I, I'm on the uh, administrative side, not the academic side. So you know, I think what what I'm hoping to do, and I think what you know, Molly. Um, has me on this committee to try to do is to create connections that hadn't existed before. Um, mm -hmm. No, I understand. So, uh, and so I, I think that, you know, one thing that I, I just wanted to make clear, like with, with LARP um, and, and, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to come into a likely into a consultative role, but I do think that they can help with, with um, in, envisioning uh, projects and processes. Right. And, and I think that what we need to do, is likely connect with the department, which I'm more than happy to do, and, and you know, work with the faculty there on potential projects, right? So the way that I've seen this done best um, uh, in a project in Amherst that I was involved with years before I was here at the university was that there was um, an envisioning of the Kendrick Park project. At that time, there was, you know, the, the redevelopment of Kendrick Park in the center of town, uh, was being looked at. And at that time, as part of a graduate course, there were, you know, 15 or 20 students that came up with their own scale models so that people could envision what Kendrick Park could look like under a number of different scenarios. I think similarly, like, you know, we, we could have something we, or, or we can appeal because uh, our professors have academic freedom to pick the projects that they choose, but we can appeal to the department to consider taking this on with one of their classes as a project for either one semester or for a full year. Um, and I think what we might see are, you know, the possibilities of what could happen under the current zoning and 
under what the community is, you know, kind of thinking or contemplating, or you can get really wild, right? Like what could you do just with the zoning and what might this look like based upon, you know, new urban planning principles? Um, you know, all, all there's, there's any number of ways to kind of structure the project, but I, you know, I think um, making the connection first would be something that might be helpful uh, towards galvanizing the community to think differently about Route 9 or about, you know, developable land there. And, and so I think that that might be helpful. Then after that, you know, in terms of consulting and or development partners, I think, you know, if you're looking for a consultant, there's probably municipal, you know, uh, funding that that can be acquired through grants mm -hmm. uh, to take a look at this in, in a more comprehensive way that goes out of the speculative place of an imaginative grad student. Um, or you just have the developer in there that, you know, seeing that, you know, if, if these projects by our grad students, for example, were to galvanize the community and get people excited, then maybe a developer will come along and, you know, um, work with the town and, and you know, uh, do the work there to get things going. So, you know, I, I'd like to offer that start and, you know, reach out to uh, LARP and some folks there and see what we might be able to do. Yeah, I just I wanted to raise it not not as a criticism so much as just a um, uh, setting a, a baseline that, that um, UMass has just not worked out to be a resource in our area um, in, in the field I'm working in. So I you know just want to lay that out there as a baseline that. Um, not a criticism, uh, you know, we're fine, uh, but it, it's not like we're beating off demands to, uh, or uh, is there anything we can do to help? Or is there any role we can play? Once upon a time, we would get, oh, about April, when we were having meetings in person, all of a sudden we'd have 15 kids sitting in the back of the room because they've been told to go to a planning board meeting. And um, and all of a sudden they were running out of planning board meetings they could get to, so they would all show up. But um, it, it's just been a, uh, um, I, I guess I say I'm not holding out much hope that that is going to be a um, a usable resource for us. And but I'm happy to be proven wrong. So, Bill, a couple of things. One, critique away at any time. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got thick skin, and you know, it, it, it's perfectly fine. That's also what I'm here for. Um, but uh, at the same time, I, I think you know, it's always about connections, right? And so, I think that, um, you know, very often through that department, they're looking to the uh, gateway cities within the region, right, as the opportunities and and, and kind of the learning laboratories for their students. Um, so very often, it, you know, um, unless you have a faculty member that lives in Hadley or has been keyed into something by a Hadley community member that that happens to know that uh, that uh, professor, there may not be the, you know, even the knowledge that Hadley might need that help. Absolutely. Um, and, and so um, I think, you know, by creating the connection and Molly having me here as a non-voting member, um, you know, we're kind of trying to formalize that relationship a little bit better. You know, we, we've had it, it fits and starts during my time here. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we've always worked well together in terms of, you know, uh, talking with uh, the, the town administrator and maybe the select board, but we haven't gotten into the nitty gritty with regard to a committee like this. So, um, you know, um, let's try to see if we can get someone in, in uh, a meeting coming up um, and where we can maybe present this visioning um, uh, as a potential project for them to take on. And I guess a question for, for Bill, uh, you know, we, we don't have a, a planner, as we know, on staff. Um, and this would certainly be the, the role that a, that a town planner would be playing. You know, they would be spearheading something like this. And so since we do have access to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, if, you know, if we wanted somebody to kind of flesh out this project, what it would look like, is that a resource we could potentially- oh, I think so. Yeah. There, there are multiple grants available um, 
we have a, a standing contract with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for support services on the uh, conceptual level. That's uh, um, why you see Ken at one of our meetings a month. Um, but also, we uh, did get a $15,000 grant from the uh, Planning Commission for the uh, housing production plan, mm -hmm. which was assigned to Ken because that's also something he does down there. So we saw even more of him than usual in multiple roles. And we do a lot of work with uh, Planning Commission. Um, they have uh, in the past, well, when uh, Tim Brennan lived in Hadley mm -hmm. and Chris Curtis lived in Sunderland, um, Hadley was sort of the, uh, the lab for the... Uh, non-gateway city projects so uh, that's why we came up with the transfer of development rights uh we were the first in the state i think to have a program such as that so we've, we've had we have a lot of stuff going on and we mm -hmm. do a lot work closely with pvpc okay would you um be willing maybe to, to have a conversation with ken just if we are thinking about going down this path and, and where he thinks it would make sense that they might mm -hmm. might jump in or whatever. Yeah, I know they just had a uh, round of grant funding, uh, which we stepped back from because we just got a grant last year. So uh, uh, definitely we're looking ahead. As, as with, with UMass, I understand that uh, any, any professor who's working on a uh, – lesson concept, uh, pl lesson plan concept is working on one for the fall or mm -hmm. or next spring, not this spring. Right. That's right. So uh, likewise, PVPC would be looking maybe something in the fall or maybe next spring. Um, mm -hmm. But I can talk to Ken about what's, what's there. And they were also our consultant for the update of the master plan. Um, so they, they're familiar with the getting the visioning process underway, the uh, the public meetings and the like. Mark? Yeah, I just had another thought of, um, in, in, this is separate with respect to UMass though. Um, the rents have gone up so much for students. I, I And I know that the average student at UMass is, you know, their parents make a lot more than when I was an undergraduate there, but I would imagine there's a certain need among the students for some affordable housing. And I'm wondering if there's um, there's any way, if if the university is thinking about that, if we could see if they have an interest in providing affordable housing for students. And if if that could be done in Hadley, maybe even they have, they might even have some land that we could, that they could do that with. And, and would we get credit on our uh, affordable housing for that? So we're always thinking about housing affordability and uh, you know, there is a ho housing shortage within the area. And there've been a lot of units built within the last several years. Um, I'd say going back a decade within just within the general Hadley Amherst area. Um, so I, I, I couldn't really comment you know, about what our appetite is right now. We're just about to go under, undergo a transition. Um, and I think, you know, everything right now, it will be um, looked at, you know, housing is something that will rise to the new chancellor's desk and it'll be something that uh, he'll have to tackle. Um, you may have seen the announcement today that um, we have named a new chancellor uh, who will be here in the in the fall. I didn't hear uh, Javier that. Javier Reyes, who's the interim chancellor of, um, University of Illinois Chicago at the moment, um, but he'll be with us. We're really excited. So, I, so I, there's a lot that, that I can't comment on yet, but this is something that we're bringing um, to the fore. In fact, our um, current chancellor, um, Chancellor Subaswamy, brought this up in at the community breakfast. So, this is something that we're grappling with. It's something I'm advocating for, and in, in, in you know, for us to think about, and, and just also. How can we work with our local communities in terms of creating more housing going forward? I don't think that this is only going to be an opportunity for communities, though, around students as we go forward. 
Um, as you might know, the, um, the university announced its uh, carbon zero initiative. Uh, we're trying to become a carbon free or carbon neutral campus by 2032. Um, so uh, with that comes along, you know, the idea of being a carbon neutral campus doesn't necessarily mean that people are driving 30 miles away to to home and an internal combustion and you know uh with their com internal combustion engine or even in an electric car right people are going to want to live closer um to where they work um and that i think is going to open up a lot of opportunities for communities to think about their housing plans particularly around the university um there's going to be more of a demand i think in next in, in upcoming generations to live closer to where you work and to where you um shop etc so um, I just put that out there that these are uh, things that, you know, I'd love to talk with you all just as, as we envision um, going forward. Okay, thanks, Tony. Okay, well, a couple of action items then on the um, that Route 9 visioning um, to at least, you know, get more information for our, for our next meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let's see. So next on the agenda, so scheduling. And I know we only have a a subset of our of our team here, um, so I'm going to need to reach out. Uh, not everybody responded to the doodle poll, um, and uh, you know there are a couple of people who have affirmed that they want to continue on the committee, but but um, they really haven't been participating. So I'm going to reach out to them individually and see if I can get a commitment one way or the other, if they, if they want to continue or not. But I, I guess the, the general question is up until now, what we've done is because um, several of us are on other committees, subcommittees and the like um, have other things going on in our lives. We've done the doodle poll and just scheduled it when it was most convenient for the largest number of people to attend. Um, certainly another way to do it that works successfully with other committees is to pick a particular, you know, the first Monday of every month or the third Thursday of every month or whatever. Um, I'm inclined to think meeting once a, mo a month is is enough, um, but wanted to um, ask all of you what your thoughts are and what would, what would work best for you. I'd say once a month would be fine if we had something that was imperative for us to ex explore or to discuss, then maybe we could come back to the table to set a date for that moment. But I mean, if we can handle everything and, and have a detailed outlook and agenda for that one day a month, I think it would be beneficial unless some of the board thinks we should have more than once a month. I think one a month is fine, and I like the idea of doing it on something like the second Tuesday or what, our second, you know, just a, a, yes. a fixed day. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, right. Okay, and I, look, I looked back at our meeting schedules, and it, it does seem like Thursdays have generally, and again, people's schedules could have changed because we haven't met in so long, but previously it seemed like Thursdays or um uh, you know, like a Wednesday before the select board or something, you know, was working. But we also have people now who are working and like Crystal doesn't get out of work until a little bit later. So at least for both um, Bill, Mark, uh, Crystal, Tony, since you're going to be invited, you know, would a, would a Thursday seem to be the best? I think so. I mean, it's the end of the week. You know, it's something that we can all be comfortable, or I can be comfortable with. You know, I wouldn't mind it at all. Okay, relative, and it's, it's relative, time to reschedule, which will be fine too. That's relatively fine. few other boards schedule meetings for Thursdays. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, and that's good for you, Mark, because I remember previously, you know, obviously you have a teaching schedule and that, that would work for you. Thursday is great for me. A Thursday evening is perfect. Okay. Um, second Thursday of the month, or sounds good. Yeah. Now, do you think we'll have enough information for the second Thursday of the month? 
to go over for the agendas or do you think we should do it the third Thursday? Um, well, yeah, I mean, right now, uh, I guess we're looking at, well, let me just see what the March calendar would be. Okay. The 9th or the 16th. Okay. When is the planning uh, board monthly meeting? Or they, they do it twice a month. Yeah, first and third Tuesdays. Okay, Tuesdays. So if okay. we were the, were you saying the, the second Thursday or third Second Thursday. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking the second, the second Thursday. Uh, okay. Now, the only thing there is that that would be the night at right after the housing production plan. So, on the one hand, that's two meetings in a row, but on the other hand, it's also fresh on our mind. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm just going to be the. I have a meeting on that particular night, actually, and it doesn't happen often, but. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, if uh, do we want to go to the 16th of March then? And then how does the 16th work for I, I'm fine with the 16th. The third Thursday, I'm fine with that. Me too. Yeah. That's the, uh, so the third Thursday. That'll be the third Thursday. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And what I can do again is, you know, let me get affirmation from the other committee members that they want to continue um, you know, put this out in an email to everybody and say that this is what we're landing on. Kind of speak now or forever hold your peace if you don't think you're ever going to be able to, to come to that. You know, and if four other people now say, no, we can never do the third Thursday, we could readdress it. But I think it's a good starting point. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the only other thing I, I had, I guess this is, uh, I'm going to call it unforeseen items only because it came up at select board last night. So oh. technically it was unforeseen. Um, the select board's going through, we have uh, a laundry list of committees that are meeting with some degree of frequency. Um, everything, you know, from the agricultural commission to, you know, cultural council, our group, ambulance oversight. And what we're trying to do is get our heads or hands around uh, more formal structure for all of the committees because some of them, they exist and they meet, but there's no written mission statement. Um, so I volunteered at our meeting last night since obviously I'm sitting on this committee as well as the ambulance oversight to either go back in history and the archives to try to find the original mission statement because I did think that we had one. Um, and, uh, if not, at least I know I've got the kind of the talking points around why we wanted this committee to exist, um, when it was originally formed, but uh, I've wanted to bring uh, a draft of that back to our group to review, um, and then it would have that go to the select board for their approval. Okay. 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 So I have an update from the meeting of the Finance Committee, which did spend approximately half an hour discussing their views on the Econolodge conversion. So um, I was encouraged, I, I, I was instructed to watch the, uh, w watch the video uh, to get the full flavor of it. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure when uh, Alex will have that up. Um, but uh, the Finance Committee is, I guess, decided not to take a vote, not to take a position on it because it may or may not have a financial impact. But there definitely is an undercurrent out there that I'm aware of that is, um, I'm not, 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 not unanimously in favor of the concept mm -hmm. okay well vis-a-vis -vis your comment on salem exactly yeah yeah so it'll be worth seeing uh you know the finance committee uh had to say about it and that's the great thing about committees it's always good to have uh, diverse opinions because then you do find out kind of gives you insight into to what positions uh, others uh, may be taking or what worries or concerns that they have so um, it would probably be good for Laura Baker to um, 
view that meeting as well. So maybe we can just let her know that there was a conversation that took place too. Yeah. Okay. All right. So sorry, ran a little long here. I was trying to keep it to an hour. Um, everybody, uh, anything else for the good of the order or? I'm just glad I'm part of this group and I do foresee in our future progress. Yeah, happy mm -hmm. to have you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. So hopefully we will uh, see people at the Econolodge ZBA hearing, uh, the Hadley Production Plan meeting on the 8th. Um, and if not, we'll see you on the 16th.